Okay, let's talk about finding the derivatives of inverse trigonometric functions. And as a baseline, something that's going to be really important for you to understand before coming into this lesson is really the domain and range of inverse trig functions. Um, so if you haven't really had a chance to go through that, I encourage you to stop the video right now and go ahead and click on the linked videos that I have below, uh, which are my lessons covering the pre-calculus of inverse trigonometric functions. And in those lessons, I discuss things like the domain and range and how we can draw triangles to represent the angles for that are unknown, but that we can still uh, use the side lengths to evaluate the trig function. So all that are in all that is covered in the two videos below. So if you haven't had a chance to review um, inverse trig functions, I encourage you to stop first and make sure you watch those before you come into the list, this lesson. So I am going to assume at this point then that you've had a chance to work with inverse trigonometric functions, which will then allow us to pretty easily derive the formulas for the derivatives of these inverse trig functions. So let's go ahead and let's start by looking at this first um, inverse derivative that we're going to find. We're going to find the derivative of the arc sine of x. Now, make sure we understand what, what this is saying. This is equivalent to us finding the derivative of the arc sine of x being equal to some angle y. So we can then say that the derivative of this is e the derivative of this statement is equivalent to finding the sine of some angle y, and that is going to be equal to some ratio x. So this is an equivalent derivative here. We're, we're saying that finding the derivative of the arc sine of x is equivalent to finding the derivative of sine of y is equal to x. Well, now that we have this statement and this equation written here, we see that we're really just going to be implying implicit differentiation. So what is the derivative of sine of y with respect to x? That is the cosine of y times y prime, whatever the derivative of y is. The derivative of x is just 1. So then we can pretty easily just isolate y prime and say that's 1 over cosine of y, which is equivalent to the secant of y. Now we want to express this in terms of x. And so this is where that tri the triangle that we are accustomed to drawing for the sine of y is going to come in. So let's go back to this statement here. Going back to this statement here. We know that taking the sine of some angle y results in x. Well, what is sine? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. So the opposite over the hypotenuse is x, which means one way of expressing this triangle is to say that this opposite side of is x and our hypotenuse is 1. Right? So the sine of angle y then gives us x over 1, which is just x. So using the Pythagorean theorem then, we can then say, let me actually just do this on the side in a separate color. We know that if this side here is equal to a, a squared plus x squared is equal to 1. a squared then is equal to 1 minus x squared. So then a is equal to plus or minus root 1 minus x squared. And since we're in quadrant 1, we don't really have to worry about a negative radical. So we can just say a is equal to root 1 minus x squared. So that's what we're going to say here. So I'm going to replace this a, oops, I'm going to replace this a with root 1 minus x squared. So now that we have that, we can then say that the secant of y, y prime, is equal to secant, which is hypotenuse, over adjacent, 1 over root 1 minus x squared. And this is the derivative of the arc sine of x. It's 1 over root 1 minus x squared. And there is obviously a chain rule form of this as well. So if x is not just the variable x, but some function of u, we can then say that the derivative of arc sine of u is u prime over root 1 minus u squared, which is this formula here. Okay. So if you'd like to, you could actually pause the video and derive all the inverse trig function derivatives. And if you'd like to do that right now, you can go ahead and do so. And check your answer with what I have posted here. Now, there are a couple of notes and a few more that I actually do want to derive with you, but I do want to point out. First off, we don't really need to repeat the same process for the co-functions because hopefully we understand that the co-function derivatives are really just going to be the negatives or the same structures as their co-functions multiplied by negative one. So the arc cosine's derivative is negative u prime over root one minus u squared. And 
if that really isn't making sense, then just think about what type of triangle you're drawing with arc cosine of x. We're saying that this is y, this then would be x over 1, and this now is our root 1 minus x, uh, 1 minus x squared. So we have a pretty similar triangle, right? We're just switching around our opposite and adjacent sides. And if you take the derivative of cosine, you're going to result in negative sine. So that's really just going to take the same triangle, but now you're introducing a negative. So all of our co-functions, arc um, cosine, arc cosecant, arc cotangent, are really just their co-functions derivatives um, multiplied by negative 1. So I won't derive all those. But I do want to talk briefly about the derivative of the arc secant of x. And let me actually move down so I have some space to work with here. Let's find the derivative of the arc secant of x. So we can say that this is equivalent to saying the following. The derivative of arc secant of x is equivalent to saying that the secant of some angle y is equal to x. Okay? Well, now let's differentiate this implicitly. The derivative of secant y is secant y times tangent y, and all of this times y prime. Okay, you don't need the parentheses there, but I'm just going to do that just so I can effectively group. The derivative of x is equal to 1. And if I isolate y prime, I get 1 over secant of y tangent of y. And I'm going to draw my triangle now so that I can see what that is, what secant of y is in terms of x. So going back to my original equation here, I know that when I take the secant of y, which is hypotenuse over adjacent, I get just x. So hypotenuse over adjacent is x, which using the Pythagorean theorem, I can then say that my opposite side is root x squared minus 1. So plugging in what we know then, what is this secant of y? The secant of y is equal to x, we already said that. What is now the tangent of y? The tangent of y is opposite over adjacent, opposite over adjacent, so that's just gonna be root x squared minus one. But there is, however, something pretty important that's missing here, and that is x has to be the absolute value of x. Well, let's discuss this real quick. Why the absolute value of x? Well, remember, the range, remember the range of arc secant of x. What is the range of arc secant of x? And if you recall, the range of arc secant of x is from 0 to pi over 2. Oops, whoa. Let me actually delete this. I don't need this. Pi over 2 to pi, inclusive here. That is to say, all the angles that come out of arc cosecant are all the angles can be any angle from 0 to pi, not including pi over 2. And the, and the point here is that I want to emphasize that the angles that come out of arc secant are angles that exist in quadrants 1 or 2. And in these quadrants, secant of y and tangent of y must have the same signs. Let's think about that. In quadrant 1, secant is positive and tangent is positive. Well, we're multiplying secant by tangent. So secant times tangent is always going to result in a positive value. What about in quadrant 2? In quadrant 2, secant of y is actually negative, and tangent of y is also negative. So a negative times a negative, this also is going to result in a positive value. So if our angles can only exist in quadrants 1 and 2, the product of secant y and tangent y must be positive. So we we introduce this absolute value here just to ensure that the, the product of secant of y and tangent of y, this denominator here must always be positive, right? And we only need to put it around the x just to, because the square root of something is always going to be a positive real number. So we really don't have to worry about that. So we just make sure that our x term is going to have an absolute value, okay? So hopefully we can understand now how we've derived all of these inverse trig function rules. Take a moment, jot these down, uh, take a screenshot if you need to, but start committing these to memory. And again, if you are um, still not fully sold on this, go ahead and try to derive uh, these inverse derivative rules um, in a process similar to what I just modeled. But let's do a couple of practice problems now. 
So I won't do all of these. I, I want to leave a few of these for you to try on your own, but let's start with a really basic one. Something like y prime here. What is the derivative of arc sine of 2x? Well, I know that the derivative of arc sine is u prime over root 1 minus u squared. The derivative, if this is my u, the derivative of 2x is 2. Square root of 1 minus whatever my 2x is squared. And that's it. And we can clean this up, obviously, to write this as root 1 minus 4x squared. But there's my derivative. Okay. All right. What about something like number 3? Let's jump to number 3. Well, this is my u here. u prime is going to be negative 1 over 2 root x. So y prime is equal to negative 1 over 2 root x all over root 1 minus whatever our u squared is, right? Because we're doing arc cosine, which is this rule here. Or sorry, u squared minus 1. Sorry about that. u squared minus 1, which is going to be x. Or, oh, I apologize. I was pointing at the wrong rule. Sorry about that. <laughs> that is 1 minus x. There we go. So y prime is indeed, if I clean this up, uh, negative 1 over 2 root x minus x squared. Okay? All right. Let's look at something like number 5. So for number 5 here, we have a composition. First off, what is the arc sine? What, well, if we write, let's set this up first. y prime over the derivative of all this, this is, we're, since this is a composition, we're going to be using the chain rule. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, whatever our argument is, times the derivative of our inner function, which is the derivative of arc sine of x. That's 1 over root 1 minus x squared. Okay. Now, we can't just leave this as secant squared composed of arc sine of x. So if we need to draw a triangle, we can. That is to say, the angle y here gives you... Um, Opposite over hypotenuse, this is x, this is 1, which means this side is root 1, mi 1 minus x squared. So the arc sine of x, which is just some angle y, well, if this is my angle y, and these are the side lengths that correspond with it, what is the secant of y? Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So that's secant of y. But it's secant squared of y, so we have to square this. That is to say, uh, 1 squared is just 1, and our denominator, root 1 minus x squared squared, is just 1 minus x squared. And then we're multiplying this by root 1 minus x squared. We're bringing this part down here. Okay? So all of this here was secant squared composed of arc sine of x. Okay? All right, and let me just try... Again, I don't want to do all of them. Let me try one more here. Let me try something like number 8. This one's fairly straightforward. Arc cosine's derivative is negative 1 over root 1 minus x squared. Arc sine's derivative is root 1 minus x squared. 1 over root 1 minus x squared. And these are just the opposites of one another. So y prime is just equal to 0. Okay? All right, so hopefully this gives a good sense of how to actually derive the rules for differentiating inverse straight functions. And once you understand that, then they should be fairly straightforward to commit to memory.